Spring had been chaotic. One day could be as warm as early summer. The next dropped 35 centimeters of snow in the highlands, only to see it disappear again the next day. But when the sky finally turned blue, I was out the door and deep into new terrain, already scouting for the new season's forage. I love mushrooms, but take it from experience. Though delicious lightning mushrooms might be up early, it's best leave them alone. But you have to be stubborn to live in the bush, and I suppose sometimes I'm just a little slow to learn my lesson. Yeah, in general, you want to leave those guys alone. They just don't quit. And believe me, they really don't like getting eaten. So I gave up, went upland till I found an old dirt road, and headed east seeing where my feet would take me. It wasn't long till I found a little river full of vigorous rapids and little pools that would do for excellent trout fishing if I so chose. And as the fickle weather seemed to be holding out good, I decided to press further into the forest and have a gander at the first new buds of the spring season. There is a lot of Inonotus obliquus around. That's the stuff most people know as chaga. And deep in the old forest where few people tread, I've sometimes found conchs weighing over 50 pounds. But this is the first time I've ever found one on the underside of a branch. Long ago, that conch dropped and fell away. This looks to be a bracket of red-belted fungi, so old its color has long since been bleached by the sun. And upon this moss-covered snag, we find new brackets of the fungus Fomes fomentarius. The ones at the bottom are freshest, you can tell by the new white stratum of growth. And as we progress up the snag, the brackets become older and older. This is not always their growth habit, but it's certainly how it worked out upon this fallen tree. Spring may not be the best time to search for edible forageables, though if you know what to look for, there are always some things that can be found. But spring is a great time to find medicinals. And with that in mind, I decided to descend out of this hilltop valley to a lake in one of the broad hollows. Winds are kicking up, and though there is yet barely a cloud in the sky, I have a feeling weather is coming. But in the bright high sun, the strong wind looks like it's pushing waves of diamonds over the little lake. And I send up a small drone to see if I can capture some of the natural majesty. The wind is blowing so hard, it outruns the drone but not so hard that I cannot keep control of the drone, and I send it to the far side of the lake to scout for water lilies, a useful edible, but they are not up yet. But a careful eye reveals other things are, here is a bunchberry plant regaining its color and soon to make fruit in the summer. But the spring warmth drops suddenly to just above freezing. I decide to make my way into a heavily wooded little glen, where scattered copses of hardwoods and conifers grow tall, but no sooner do I enter the old forest when I encounter a variety of wildlife themselves preparing for spring. There are deer and red squirrels, the spore of black bear and coyote, telltales of porcupines and martens. But what fascinates me is this queen orange-belted bumblebee, Bombus tenarius. I've stumbled upon her in the creation of a new nesting site where she had straddled her eggs and was pulsing her abdomen in order to warm them so that they hatch quickly. And now, having warmed the eggs, She'll take flight in search of pollen and nectar, which she needs to keep the engine of her body going through the arduous process of incubating her eggs. <laughs> that was great. That was good footage. And no sooner does the bumblebee fly away than I look up to see an American goldfinch, Spinus tristis. This is a brightly colored male, but I cannot tell if he's looking for a mate 
or if he's already found one and he's foraging in preparation for nesting. But the Maritime Provinces are part of their upper northernmost permanent range, though I never see them here year-round. I suspect they only venture into these cold highlands when the weather becomes warmer and a bit more appealing. Though the cold damp conditions of this high country, especially here in the shadows of a grove of conifers, make for the expansive growth of the incredibly useful medicinal sphagnum moss. It's available summer and winter, but you're going to want to know where it is in advance should you need it in winter, because you'd have to dig under deep snow to get it. There are some 380 species of sphagnum, and since each like slightly different growing conditions, often they grow together in their masses. They use water to support their structure, and therefore hold a lot of water. When it's dry, it can feel like walking on a shag carpet, but when the fickle weather suddenly burst into a cold downpour, and moments later turn clear and warm again, going over the sphagnum moss felt like walking on a thick, wet sponge. There are many sphagnum moss species, and they can be hard to tell apart. Typically, they will grow in dense carpets. Even if it's dry, the carpets will be damp if you stick your finger into them. In the maritime provinces, the carpets are typically green. They detach easily from the ground, and the underside will be dead. If you look at them up close, they resemble tiny conifer trees, complete with tiny leaflets and branches. This sphagnum moss has just been rained on, so it's rather spongy. But you can pull it up with your bare hands, wet or dry. It's very good at holding moisture, feels a bit like a sponge. Often there'll be bits of dirt underneath. When you pull it up, you can pick much that off with your fingers. And to get the remainder off, just hold it in a gently flowing clear stream until the remaining dirt particles have flowed away. Then you can crush it and pack it over a wound under a bandage to help keep the wound sterile while it heals. This is one of nature's most useful healing forageables, and it's available in the north, year-round. Having found and filmed our topic of discussion, I thought I'd head back to camp for dinner. And with the weather clearing up, all was looking good. But it seemed it was just going to be one of those days. Seriously? Oh well, better than lightning mushrooms. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist program is committed to the reliable coverage of all matter of topics relating to natural science, from ecology and conservation to the nature of the universe beyond our Earth, and making that information practical with solid advice on living well with the natural world. If you appreciate the program, please take a moment to subscribe. Subscribing costs nothing and never will, but it sure helps a lot.